Dino, our first president, who was president for 10 years, had everything in his head. He had this incredible memory and would take these little intricacies and make everything work. He managed everything so masterfully, I could never have done what I've done without his help. So what I've tried to do coming in in his immediate wake is to try to systematize everything and create structures for everything so that when I step out of the position, there'll be structures in place so that anyone who follows in this position now will have systems to help them navigate it. When I was an undergrad, I fell in love with Robert Browning's poetry. But when I went to grad school, it was really George Eliot's Middlemarch that hooked me. Um, it's the most amazing novel ever written. You feel like you know the inside of these people's hearts and spirits and minds, and it's just so profoundly moving at all of its crisis points. But a big part of what got me hooked on Victorian studies was the fact that it's close enough to us that we can understand it pretty easily. It's socially close enough to, that we recognize how things work, but it's far enough away that we have critical distance. And because my work is on social justice, what's really important to me is using the 19th century as a way for us to look at ourselves. So if we can look critically at uh, something that's happening in the 19th century, it may help us be able to read our own cultural moment better. One of the things that we're really trying to do now is think about how we can serve our membership in new ways. Now we're beginning to look at structures that we can put in place that will help us mentor each other as a body. So how can our, our new junior faculty mentor um, grad students or our senior faculty mentor grad students, but also how can our senior faculty mentor junior faculty or faculty who've become administrators or taken on special chairships, mentor other senior faculty who are interested in those kinds of positions. And so we're looking for ways to get people connected so that they can all support each other and find ways to connect with each other. So we are a platform where everyone can come and talk about the amazing scholarship they're doing. And even from its inception, People went to NAVSA when they didn't even have a paper to deliver because they just wanted to know what was going on in the field. It had that power almost instantaneously. So we've asked about how we can work with publishers, how we can work with um, journals, how we can get access for electronic materials to our membership and not just be a platform for the exchange of great ideas, but also be a service to our community. If you really want to have your voice heard because you have a unique contribution to make, you're going to have to take a leap off the beaten path. And that feels risky for a lot of people. So a lot of people wait to do that until they're full professors because then it's safe. There's no question that as I became more senior in my career, I took bigger risks. But even my first project, I had someone on my committee tell me, you can't write about domestic violence because I'd run a battered women's shelter for six years. You can't write about domestic violence because you're too close to it. I thought long and hard about that. Does this somehow disqualify me to write about domestic violence? And I decided that in fact it gave me a perspective that other people wouldn't have and that people who were writing on domestic violence without that body of knowledge wouldn't be able to have the kinds of insights that I could have. And I made the decision to go ahead and write my dissertation on that subject. I made the case for it, my committee accepted it, I wrote on that subject, and then that's what I published my first book on. But I think that one of the most wonderful things you can do is to figure out what you really want to contribute to the field and what you really want to say to the world because humanists have so much to say. It's really, really important that the kinds of ideas that we're wrangling with and the things that we're thinking through, that we can think about their implications for the culture that we inhabit. Maria Bachman, Heidi Kaufman, and I came out with a book um, not too long ago on xenophobia and its emergence in the 19th century as a construct. And that book has had huge um, media attention in the last year because of what's been happening in Europe and because of what's been happening in the U.S. in terms of how foreigners are perceived. What's exciting to me about that is that it's given this group of uh, Victorianists an opportunity to talk to the public about what it means to be, to have a fear of foreigners and how it shapes our thinking and what ways we might want to challenge ourselves as we're thinking about that and what kinds of questions we might want to ask ourselves. That seems really important to me. And so I would love to see more people think about how their voice can be heard and how their voice can be heard by a larger audience. I think the Victorian equivalent to the hashtag is the headline because this is the period of 
mass media, right? We suddenly have newspapers that are getting churned out in every subject, in every city, in every small town. And, and headlines could be reproduced in their exact format and formula all across the country. And because it was reproduced over and over and over again, it's almost, it became almost like a hashtag. And, and I'm working right now on, on murder cases from the 19th century. And, and so one of the ways that those sort of became hashtagged was often by the street on which they were committed, the great Quorum Street murder. And then that would appear in a million permutations of headlines. And that would be essentially what the Victorian hashtag was. I really want to thank our advisory board and our executive committee who work all year long, all through the summer. They do enormous heavy lifting on committee work. They read all the books that get nominated for our book prize. They read articles for the article prize. They consult with the groups that are putting on the conferences. And they do a labor that's largely invisible. I also want to thank our, our conference organizers because our conference is in some ways the beating heart of the organization. We have NASA 2016 coming up in Phoenix in November, and then we have a supernumerary in Florence. Um, that'll be NASA 2017, and then we have our regular NASA 2017 in Banff, Canada. I also want to thank Dennis Denisoff, who is the president-elect and the current vice president of the organization. He's absolutely wonderful, and I'll be leaving the organization in his able hands when I step down.